she's pinch hitting uh, for the next two Sundays, Rena Taylor. Thank you, Rena. Yay! <laughs> Also, if this pertains to you, kindly let us know. We are not always made aware of who sends us stock. The brokers typically don't do that. They just send us the stock, and we're grateful for that, but we want to make sure that people get due credit. So if you donated 150 shares of a Pepsi stock to Sycamore, please let our business office know. Thank you. A couple other things we want to highlight for you. Coming this Friday, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. We also want to be alert to a special family opportunity for service, really for all ages, Matthew 25 Ministries, on Saturday the 21st from 11 to 1. And then a new piece in our life, uh, which folk have appreciated because it provides a more relaxed opportunity to converse and share issues of faith as we all seek to better know and understand God's mission for each and every one of us. Pub theology uh, happening at the Casual Pint in Loveland this coming Thursday, the 12th from 7 to 830 p.m. So many things happening in our life and work. You're encouraged to find a place to grow, a place to serve, a place to belong, and a place to share your heart with others. This ends our morning announcements. Please join me for the call to worship. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne.
one of the promises of Scripture is that when we go to God asking for his forgiveness, that he does pour his forgiveness into our lives, that we must never be afraid to go and ask for his forgiveness. Nothing in our lives is outside of his forgiving reach. With that in mind, let us pray together the prayer of confession. God of joy, you have invited us to your holy presence, but we turn away. You have welcomed us into a relationship with you, but we spurn your call. We are afraid of what you might require of us. We confess we have resisted the intimacy of your care. Forgive us, warm our hearts to your embrace. Quicken our voices to sing your praise. And inspire us to dance in joy before you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us continue with a moment of uh, personal confession. We are no longer strangers nor aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. Hear God's word as I share it with you. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. The word of the Lord. I invite any kids that are here to come to the front chancel area with me. It's you and me, Ben. Oh, good. Hi. Come on up. I promise I won't bite. Hi. Good morning. It's good to see you guys. We're so glad you're here. It's good to see you. So, were any of you guys listening to Dr. McQuaid as he read that lesson? 
No, neither was I. No, it's okay. <laughs> no, um, Dr. McQuaid read a lesson to us. And it's one of those where I think a lot of times we hear them and it's really confusing because it's like dogs eating scraps of food and Jesus talking to them and I read them and I go, huh, what? But you know what? The whole purpose of that story is to remind us that God's love is bigger than anything. It is so big and so great that all of us get to be part of God's love. We're all part of God's family. And no matter where we come from and what we do, God's love is big enough to invite us as the whole family. Pretty simple, right? Don't you wish he would sometimes just say that? Yeah, it would be easier. Your parents ever talk to you in crazy ways and you're like, just tell me what you want. Yeah, I get it. Will you guys pray with me? Dear God, we give thanks that you love us and you extend your grace to all of us. Help us to remember to tell that to other people as we meet them this week. And all God's children said, amen. You guys can head back to your seats. Thanks for coming up. Friends, will you please pray with me? Dearest Lord Jesus, may we look on the majesty of your presence 
and bend to you, to your will, to your glory, and to your love. Made real in your holy name we pray. Amen. I have come to the realization that wherever I turn in my family's life, I am going to meet a strong woman. I say that with deep affection and respect. It also tends to make life a whole lot more interesting. My mother-in-law is in this service. We have four generations of strong women in our family. Uh, my mother-in-law is 94, and she has plenty of spirit. I'm grateful for it. If you know Joyce, you know that she's very fun-loving, and she can also be beautifully formidable. I met with strength. Our daughter Liz, our daughter-in-law Sarah, both striking ladies who have plenty of spunk, and I respect it. And then, our granddaughter, Miss Vivian, who is two. Oh my, she's such a pretty little girl, and she's a natural helper, and she is filled with sass. <laughs> we have this little game we play in our family when the grandkids are over, which is every week. Uh, if they have a fake cough, not a real cough, but a fake cough, they can go take a pill, which is an M&M. <laughs> <coughs> now, Kai is three, so he's allowed three M&Ms. And he will pull them out dutifully, put them on the table, and eat them, and one day he will be an engineer. <laughs> Vivi, she will put her whole hand in the candy jar and just stare at you, daring you to stop her. Well, after we talk her down, she settles with two M&Ms, We've put our grandson, actually, since he's the older one, in charge of the candy jar, and he decided there needed to be a conversation the other day, and he said, Vivi, why do you put your whole hand in the candy jar? And she responded, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> he wasn't ready for that or expecting it. But he was undaunted, and a couple of days later, they were together again at our home, and he went right back to it. Good. He said, Vivi, why do you put your whole hand in the candy jar? And she went... <laughs> I don't know. I keep telling Vivi's parents... One day, there's going to be a young man that will so fall in love with her, and he will have no idea whatsoever what he's gotten a hold of. <laughs> you gotta love the spunk. Well, it is in that spirit this morning that Jesus is confronted by a lady. A lady that I would say probably has plenty of sass, certainly has strength of spirit, someone who is wonderfully and dutifully persistent. The backstory is very interesting. For the first time in the Gospels, Jesus is outside of Jewish territory. We're told he's in the region of Tyre and Sidon, which would have been seaport towns. He's in Gentile territory. Why would he be traveling up there? Most of the reading I've done would all echo the same. He was looking to disconnect. He was trying to find a way, perhaps, to catch a breather, to 
step back because everywhere he went in the Jewish realm, he would be confronted by somebody who had a need, someone who would want something from him, and it probably felt like he didn't have a moment's peace. So really, at this moment, they've gone offline to another area, and what happens? He's confronted by somebody who has recognized him and has heard about him and who has a profound request. You ever have those moments when you just need some breathing space? You just want to disconnect? You just need that window where you can kind of gather your thoughts? For me at least, that desire on Christ's part is reinforced because when she says to him, son of David, she makes her request for the healing of her daughter, and he says nothing. He's silent. The disciples are getting a little frustrated or perturbed because she is very persistent, and they want Jesus to send her away. It's like they claim a right for a breather too. And Jesus responds to them by saying, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. He redefines his mission. His mission is to help the Jewish people get back on track, to reconnect them with God's life, God's purpose, God's promise, because they have been so wayward and he says, this is the scope of what I'm called to do. But this woman is persistent. She will kneel before Jesus. Please help me. We're told that her daughter is demon-possessed. Jesus makes a statement that we find very curious on face value. He said, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Jesus, come on! It sounds like a horribly harsh thing for him to say. Did you get out of bed on the wrong side this morning? Are you annoyed? What's going on? Until we pay a little more careful attention to the language Jesus is using. It was common in that day for the Gentiles to be referred to as dogs. It is not flattering, but it was a common part of the vocabulary. Jesus tweaks it just a little. We're told that he uses a diminutive form of the word that you could likely more readily translate as puppies, something a little more affectionate, something that gives you a little more maneuvering room. William Barclay is quick to point out, it is not only what is said, but it is how it is said. And he imagines that Jesus sees in this woman a spirit that he doggedly admires. And that he must have responded with something of a twinkle in his eye, an affection of heart, an opening that she could grab onto. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she responds, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Oh, wow, you're right. According to your faith, your healing is granted for your daughter. It's a beautiful thing. It's a rare exchange. It's not filled with a whole lot of pious language. She is granted the healing of her daughter, and she also recognizes that the Lord of life would even banter with her. He sees within her a strength, 
a determination, a resolve. She doesn't flinch, and she comes right back at him. You don't see a whole lot of stories like this one in the scripture, and it's often left me feeling that Jesus has supreme affection for those who are unadorned. Those who do not give in to the artificial. Those who are genuine, authentic, you know what you see is what you get. Those making no parade of religious behavior or a false kind of piety. Jesus seems to be drawn to those who have an earthy reality attached to them. He's certainly come to love and bless all humanity. But I think there's a special corner of his heart reserved for people like this lady. His special responsiveness to a woman who would come and grab hold to his cloak, knowing that he possessed the power, wanting to be connected to his healing. Jesus, who would name Peter to be head of the disciples. Jesus always responded to the common touch. And he would talk about, he hasn't come for those who are self-satisfied, but for those who know that they need a doctor's care. Jesus blesses her on foreign territory. Sometimes in the life of the church, we may be content to parade more of a religious demeanor, to appear to be spiritual as a shield to really letting our real selves be known. After all, if our real selves are known, some may not like it. They may misunderstand and reject us. So we often have a different kind of behavior on occasion in the life and work of the church. Sometimes we even use a more limited vocabulary, and there are things we would never say. I've been struck very recently by the writing of a very gifted lady named Barbara Brown Taylor. Barbara doesn't presently serve a church. In 2018, she made the list of the 12 most effective preachers in the English language, along with people like Andy Stanley, Tim Keller, Haddon Robinson, John Piper, and there's Barbara. Barbara served a multi-staff church in Atlanta, an Episcopal church. Day and, day and night, she was living the church and doing so many of the things that are required, even organizationally, to keep the church functioning. She left that to take a small parish in northern Georgia. She was such a gifted preacher that they soon were talking about a building program because they couldn't contain the crowds who were coming to hear her. And I think it all got to be too much, and she stepped away and took a position as a religion instructor at Piedmont College. She said, I've never left the ministry, and the congregation I serve now is much, much larger. And she said, sometimes in ministry, you are shielded from things. People see you coming and they change what they're talking about. She said, I would go to a pool party and I would be the one person not thrown in because I was clergy. She said, I wanted to make a deeper connection with God's heartbeat in life without some of the trappings and complications of what I was so often called to do so this woman, whose 
regarded as among the very finest English-speaking preachers, no longer serves a church. She has a very interesting insight. She said, often in the life of the church, it has been our attitude that our role is to bring people in and make them like us. She said, I think the real sign of faithfulness is how we send people in the world and into the world to connect and to bless what God is already doing. And she said, if our focus is on sending, quite naturally, there'll be more people coming because they'll get the direct connect. Much in the spirit of what we did in our day of service in April, to honor, to bless, to recognize what God is doing out in the world, and we're called to be a sending congregation. Sometimes those opportunities can have power beyond anything you would ever imagine. A couple of summers ago, I was camped, reading and reading and reading and planning a couple of sermon series. And I walked into this little village at night, and they had a little tavern, and I wanted to get a burger and a beer. And I wanted to keep reading. So when I came in, I saw the barmaid, and I said, can you put me somewhere where there's good light? I have some things I need to read. And she put me right up at the bar in the corner where there was a overhead light. And I thought, I'm probably the only person here with a devotional book reading at the bar. The next person was halfway around the bar, and I heard him talking. And he was trying to connect with the barmaid. He was saying things like, you know, I, I didn't believe I would ever get back here. And he said, I can't say how much that means just to be here tonight. It wasn't my conversation, so I just listened. And he continued to speak, and she was busy, you know, she was trying to be attentive, but she had stuff to do. And I finally said something to him. He was probably about as close to me as I am to Tim right now. And I said, it sounds like you have had a major life event. Oh, he said, oh. He said, I nearly lost my life last week at work. And he said, when you hear the EMT folk say, he's probably got about 15 minutes and he's going into shock. It really gets to you. I couldn't say anything. And they air vac me to a hospital and I was in ICU, and it was nip and tuck. I just listened. And he said, I was just released, and I needed to get out. And so I just wanted to come here. And I said to him, I said, God's obviously not finished with you. You have more life to live and engage. And he said, but you know, it's, it's hard. He said, my wife and I are on the outs. She came to the hospital, but he said, I, I think we're divorcing. And I said, look, I don't know your circumstances, but I do know this. Whatever issues you've been dealing with, probably didn't anticipate a possible end-of-life experience for either one of you. And I said, there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. That's the change piece that puts everything else back into perspective. You've been at death's door. Neither of you thought about that happening. 
And now perhaps you'll have a different conversation about things that matter most. And he just sort of looked at me. And then he said to the barmaid, whatever that guy's drinking, give him another one. <laughs> I said, magic hat number nine, for you who love craft beer, you'll know what that is. And it got kind of quiet. And I said, you know, you've been given a great gift. You have the chance to look over your life and determine what really matters. You've been given a second chance, an opportunity to live again. And I hear your gratitude. And I said, all this is going to count somehow. And he said, what do you do anyway? <laughs> I said, I'm a pastor. Oh, he said, why didn't you warn me? <laughs> See, that's what sometimes is the response. It's like, you know, if, if I'd have known what you're about, I... I might not have shared my story. But he said, why didn't you warn me? Then he said, I should have seen it coming. And I said, I wasn't about to tell you and miss out on the free beer you bought me. <laughs> Come on, man. And he said, you know, I, I think I need to go home. He said, I don't know what it's all going to be, but I said, well, I... I just assure you that I'll be praying for you and trust what God will do with the pieces of your life that are there before you. He seems able to use everything. And he came over and he gave me a hug right there at the bar. And I thought, you know, I may never see this guy again. But I hope he goes with a sense that God deeply cares about his life and is willing to do something in the middle of these desperate circumstances that he's experienced. And he went out and he got on his motorcycle and he rode out into the dark. Obviously, I still think about him. I wish him peace. I wish him a sense of light shining in that time of darkness and I wish him to know that the companionship of his Savior is sure and unshakable I think Barbara Brown Taylor has it right we're called to send people and what might that mean for you It might mean that you go across your yard. It might mean you go across the aisle. It might mean that you go across the street. It might mean that you even go across the bar to honor and bless God's desire to touch every human heart in Christ. There is still time for us to do that but hurry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us affirm what we believe through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to our time of uh, corporate prayer, prayer together as a congregation, I'd like to remind you that we have prayer partners, individuals who are more than happy to pray with you should you feel the need of continued prayer following the service today. Uh, you may come forward uh, following the service or remain in your seats and they will come to you. And so we're grateful for those who are willing to share in this ministry. Let us pray. Lord God, we ask for your encouragement when we face times when we must persist in our faith and prayers. Help us understand that we are never done with our faith until we pass from this life into your presence. And so we pray for your continued transformation of our lives and hearts by your grace. We ask that our ears may be open to listen and our hearts attentive to receive what we would hear, so that we would continue to grow in our belief and faith. Enable us to walk according to our faith, especially during times of challenge. Please hear our silent prayers as we ask for your continued and individual work in our lives. We also pray that we would continue to grow an under, understanding of this place, this congregation, this our family of faith. That it is not about us, but rather about your kingdom. You have called us to be an outward bound congregation into our community and world. We pray that our eyes would be open to see the myriad opportunities that you present. And that what we consider to be a simple conversation with an individual may have everlasting results in their lives. Lead us and guide us in this. As with each Sunday, so also today, we have carried our own fears, worries, and joys into this place of worship. Hear our personal and silent prayers about these things. And again, we know of those who need your encouragement, perhaps a touch of your healing grace, who need to feel your arms of grace enfolding their lives. And please hear our prayers for these individuals and families that we raise to you silently.
Heavenly Father, we lift these prayers to you in the confidence that you hear all prayer. We pray for open ears, open hearts to see your answers. And hear us as together as your people we pray the prayer that your Son and our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our worship by presenting to God our tithes and our offerings.
I'm still struck by that man in the pub who gave me a great gift, uh, helped me remember some of the most essential things we all need to stay in the game. We need hope to live by and the knowledge that our Lord will never let us go. And if we're willing to listen long enough, we'll easily find plenty of places to serve out there. Trust what God can do and go with joy. Live in faith. Believe that life is good. And if you find it not, help make it so. To the glory of God who made us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, friendship, and power of the Holy Spirit lead us forward together each step of the way. Amen.